Hello and welcome to a new video. Here behind me we have uh, Huntingtower Castle, which is one of the castles around Perth. And I want to take you around for a tour today. Perth, as well as Huntingtower Castle, have some very interesting medieval history. So if you're interested, please stay tuned and come along. So here's a look at the exterior of the castle. You come past Huntingtower Castle as you drive from Perth towards Creef. And I would say it's quite easily recognisable and has a very um, distinct appearance. The story of this castle starts with the Ruffin family, as this castle was once known as the Place of Ruffin. The land itself has once been used by the Romans to build one of the many signal stations along the gas bridge. With the Romans long gone, a Norseman named Svein, son of Thor, came to Perthshire from East Lothian in the 12th century and established himself here. So here we are inside of Hunting Tower Castle. And as it turns out, we will have the castle all to ourselves for now. His grandson Swain was the first to take on the name of Ruffman, borrowed from a nearby village. During the Scottish Wars of Independence, William Ruffman fought alongside William Wallace during the Siege of Perth in 1297 and alongside Robert de Bruce in 1314 during the capturing of Jedburgh Castle. For this, he was made Sheriff of Perth, a title which practically carried down the family line. Initially, the Ruffwins probably lived in an earth and timber building, but by the 1400s, the oldest part of today's castle had been built. In 1487, the title of Lord Ruffwin was bestowed upon a later William Ruffwin by James III. William had two sons with his first wife and both received a letter of legitimation in 1480, making the older son the heir and master of Ruffwin. Perhaps Lord and Master Ruffman wanted to have their separate living quarters, or perhaps the two brothers decided to share the property. Either way, around 1500, two towers were built a mere 10 feet or 3 meters away from each other, one of those towers being a former gatehouse. These two towers form the peculiar foundation for Hunting Tower Castle. Much of the interior still dates from the two 16th century towers, including a painted ceiling which you will see later on. For the 16th century, the Ruffwins acquired more land and more political power. Patrick Ruffwin, who became third lord in 1552, was one of the leaders of the Protestant Reformation in Scotland during the reign of Mary Queen of Scots, who was famously a Catholic. She visited the castle with her second husband, Lord Darnley, in 1565. However, in March 1566, Patrick and Darnley were involved in the murder of David Riccio, Mary's personal secretary at Holyrood Palace in Edinburgh. Patrick fled to England and died in exile while Darnley was murdered. Patrick's son William was pardoned and returned as the fourth lord only to assist with Mary's imprisonment and forced abdication at Lochleven Castle. Mary's infant son James VI was crowned the new king, while frequently changing Protestant noblemen acted as regents. Some of them died in battle while others died through politically motivated assassination. When James was 15, he became close to the Duke of Lennox, who had at least outwardly converted to Protestantism. William Ruffwin, who by now had also become the Earl of Gowrie, saw a corrupting influence in the Duke and conspired to get rid of him. In August 1582, he invited the then 16-year-old James, who was just on his way home from a hunting trip up north, to his castle to stay the night, to which the young king agreed. However, the next morning the king's chamber was stormed and he was pressured to cut his ties with the Duke of Lennox. The frightened king acquiesced. This became known as the Ruffin Raid. James was held captive at this castle for 10 months, during which the so-called Gary regime acted as the head of the government. By June 1583, the king managed to escape and William was tried for treason, stripped of his titles and beheaded in May 1584. But the tensions between the Ruffins and the king didn't end here. So this is a gap that used to exist between the two towers. Got this one here and this one here. And they closed this gap. And they've obviously created this big wall here. So in this room, the lady who welcomed us just told us that you have this beautiful painted ceiling because after the castle was stripped from the previous owner, Lord Ruffwin, the castle was used 
to live in and the paintings were covered up with wooden panels and then later on the wooden panels were covered up with plaster so so then when the castle passed into the hands of the government they stripped away the plaster and the panels and they found all these paintings still preserved this is one of the oldest Scottish temper painted ceilings in existence. Temper painting was the primary panel painting medium for nearly every painter in the European medieval and early Renaissance period, up to 1500. It consisted of pigments mixed with a binding medium, usually egg yolk. It is very lucky that the wooden panels and layers of plaster which were applied on top to redecorate managed to preserve these paintings in as great a state as they could be under these circumstances. The paintings were discovered in 1913 and restored in the 1930s. So here we have some of the wall paintings. There's supposed to be a rabbit, which is just up there. And apparently there's a dragon as well. Here's some kind of angel. I just found some pretty funny looking paintings. I don't know if that's supposed to be a lion or a man or a man lion, but there's also a dragon over here. Here's a picture of what they imagine the different rooms would have looked like. It obviously would have had several stories which are now all gone. Right, so this is uh, basically a vault, this thing here, to keep safe your belongings. So we're presently in the East Tower, and it says that the kitchen was in on the ground floor, and then you had the hall on the second floor, and then above that, the private chambers. Ooh, very tight spiral staircase. Uh, I think this goes up to the private chamber. It's a nice place to sit by the window and contemplate life, or maybe read a book. And here's another latrine room. Tiny t toilet. Almost a. Uh... Somebody used it recently. <laughs> Tiny toilet. And it looks like this. This might be a staircase right above your head. So we're going to continue on the spiral staircase and hope that it will take us to the roof now. So there's an interesting story between this gap here. 
and it involves Dorothea, a daughter of the first Earl of Gowrie, and the man she was in love with was staying in the tower where we're standing at the moment, and she came to visit him in the night, and then her mother became suspicious and wanted to check on her, and Dorothea actually leapt from this battlement down to the other side, where her own chamber was to avoid any suspicion and she somehow made it and she was fine and her mother never discovered anything and then soon after she eloped with her future husband. Here you get a nice view of the former gardens although there's nothing growing there anymore and there used to be buildings here as well probably see by the outlines that all of these buildings are now gone. Look at this, the sun is shining in. Makes it all the nicer. Just to sit here with a book and read. Or maybe an old medieval manuscript, I don't know. So we're now coming down to the ground floor, I think. We are in the gap here and this is the staircase that we went up earlier. So why is this castle called Hunting Tower and not the place of Ruffin? This is to do with the Gary Conspiracy, an event equally infamous and shrouded in mystery. In the aftermath of the Ruffin raid, James VI decided to restore the 12-year-old James Ruffin, son of the beheaded 1st Earl William, to the Ruffin titles. James Ruffin passed away only two years later and his brother John became 3rd Earl. We are still in the East Tower, but we are on the ground floor, so this is the old kitchen here. It's a big massive fireplace. John became a well-travelled and well-educated man, studying in Edinburgh and Padua in Italy. He had a beautiful townhouse in Perth, where later the Sheriff's Court was built. The story of what transpired there is one-sided, told by King James VI. In 1600, the king was invited to the townhouse to interview a suspicious monk with a sum of gold, possibly funding for rebel activity. But when the king arrived, he found a chamber with no monk but armed guards. Sensing a coup d'etat or yet another imprisonment, the king shouted from the window and armed guards rushed to his help. John Ruffwin and his brother Alexander were killed in the ensuing struggle. Their corpses were taken to Edinburgh to be tried for treason and despite being already dead, they were hanged, drawn and quartered. The Ruffin family was stripped of all their titles and possessions and the castle was renamed Hunting Tower. The Murray family, Earls of Tullibardin and Athol, became the keepers of the castle. During the 1600s, they oversaw the alterations to the castle, including the closing of the gap between the two towers. In 1805, they sold the castle to James Buchan, a cloth printing factory owner who used it to house his workers. I very much like the garden, even though you can hear still the noises of the city in the background. But I think it's a great place for a picnic after you visit the castle. And it's probably good for a family day out as well. It doesn't take too long at all to go around the castle, so I can imagine that if you have children with you, it's not going to take forever and they're not going to get too bored too quickly. Although, of course, it is mostly a hollow shell, so you would kind of have to do all the imagining bits and just put yourself back into how it used to be. Under the Mercer family, who bought the house in 1863, it was given into state care from 1912 onwards. In 1913, the state began the process of renovating the castle during which the painted ceilings were discovered. Finally, in 1951, the widow of Major Lawrence Walter Mercer sold the castle to the government for £200. It is now managed by Historic Scotland. There is a small car park and the entry fee is currently £6. Historic Scotland members, of course, go free. Uh, we went back inside to have another look, another walk through because I want to go back to the roof, but here's some of the pigeon colds where the pigeons could have come in obviously there would have been a ceiling separating these but the pigeons would fly in through the window there and then they could 
just nest and sleep in those little pigeon boxes. You can just about see where the floors would have been, right there. There would have been a floor right there. You've got even the chimney there, the fireplace on the corner. And here's something we missed the first time round. The Ruffin coat of arms is also painted here on this wall by the window. And that just shows you that if you can go around a second time to catch what you've missed, then you probably should. I also want to note the lack of door in this latrine room. I guess even this private thing wouldn't have been private for very wealthy and important people because you always had the the servants around and I guess the servants would have been around for you to even go to the toilet. Although perhaps they had a little fabric covering up. Now that we've got the history down, we can focus on the details. For example, this door frame here with the very heavy and thick wooden beams and I love the staircase and I love how this is a gap that didn't used to exist and this used to be just the two towers and I think you can kind of tell that looks like it used to be a door perhaps at one point see this man here the guide said that this is probably Adam, but he's got some kind of very interesting thing right next to him. I do wonder, and there's another one up there, and there's another one there. It's quite a few of them. And then this leaping deer, perhaps. I wanted to come back outside to enjoy the view. And about the maiden sleep, this is the gap that they created later on, but I think when Dorothea was living here, that didn't exist, so it would have been just all the way down to the bottom, so you can imagine it's pretty mental, it's a three meter gap. And she jumped from here to over there. It's crazy. It doesn't look that <laughs> To be fair, um, this is a bit higher than that, so that will make it easier. But still, even though it doesn't maybe look hard, but you would have to be really, um, really brave or really, really desperate to yep. take the leap. Here's another detail that I noticed. This is for the rain to run off the roof. And these shingles are very interesting anyway. They are completely massive. Here's the size of my hand. And they're probably really sturdy as well. And he's got all these moulds for the rain to be able to dissipate. I just noticed that you, from here you can see Dunsinan, the hill fort that we occasionally like to visit. There's a, the hills over there. And you get a bit of a view so the trees are kind of in the way now, but you get a decent view. Here's the original and one true inhabitant of the castle, the pigeon. Bye-bye. So here's the sun making an appearance and sitting on the castle, making it look all nice and pretty. And to you, I want to say thank you for coming along today. Hopefully you've learned something about Huntington Castle and some of the medieval history of Perth. And if you liked it, give me a thumbs up. And hopefully we're going to be able to visit some more castles in the future. For now, thank you for watching and take care.